Well, good evening, everyone. It's good to see all of you here on a Friday evening. We are going to study the material that we have in the small booklet that you all received at your registration. I'm going to make a few adjustments. There are several things that need to be corrected, but uh, we will make those corrections and uh, go from there. I'd like to begin with a word of prayer, and then uh, we'll get right into our study. It is my hope to reach page 17 tonight, so let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before your awesome throne in the name of Jesus. We come in the name of Jesus because we know that when we do, you hear and you answer. We plead for the presence of your Holy Spirit. Give us clarity of thought, give us tender hearts, and Lord, give us the willingness and the power to share what we learn. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The first thing that we want to take a look at is the problem of sin and its solution. And we'll begin by saying that Adam and Eve's original garments were twofold. First of all, they had an invisible spiritual robe of righteousness before they sinned. And that spiritual robe of righteousness was made evident, was made visible by a literal robe of light that covered them. Ellen White in Christ's Object Lessons, pages 310 and 311, describe these two robes, the spiritual robe and the literal physical robe. And I read, The white robe of innocence was worn by our first parents when they were placed by God in Holy Eden. They lived in perfect conformity to the will of God. So there you have the first robe. It's the white robe of innocence worn by our first parents. She continues, They gave all the strength of their affections to their heavenly father. Once again, a description of their spiritual robe of righteousness. And then we have the physical robe, which made evident the spiritual robe of righteousness. It says, A beautiful soft light the light of God enshrouded the holy pair. This robe of light was a symbol of their spiritual garments of heavenly innocence. Had they remained true to God, it would ever have continued to enshroud them. So, is it clear that there's a spiritual robe and a literal robe? The spiritual robe, according to this, is that they lived in perfect conformity to the will of God. They could offer righteousness to the law. But that was made visible by a soft light that physically covered their bodies. Now, both the Bible and the writings of Ellen White make clear that the first result of sin was a loss of the spiritual robe. Spiritual nakedness came. Nakedness of soul. And as a result, nakedness of body followed. In other words, Adam and Eve lost both robes. They lost the righteousness of their soul, and they, therefore they lost the robe of light, the visible robe of light that covered their physical body. We're told in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7, the immediate result of sin, then the eyes of both of them were opened. Obviously, this is talking about spiritual eyes because their physical eyes were 20-20. So it says, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. So what was the first result of sin? Physical nakedness that came as a result of spiritual nakedness. Now what solution did Adam and Eve offer to cover 
their physical nakedness. Well, we find in Review and Herald, November 15, 1898, these words. The fig leaves represent the arguments used to cover disobedience. In other words, self-justification. Isn't that self-justification? Yes. Offering arguments, well, I did it, but... She continues, when the Lord calls the attention of men and women to the truth, the making of fig leaves into aprons will begin to hide the nakedness of what? Of the soul. However, the nakedness of the sinner is not covered. All the arguments pieced together by all who have, have interested themselves in this flimsy work will come to naught. So the fig leaf garments represent the self-justification, the excuses that they offered for sin. What did Adam say? Well, the woman that you gave me. What did Eve say? The serpent that you made. See, spiritually they're covering themselves with a robe which does not really cover their nakedness. Now, their nakedness was not merely physical because even after covering themselves with the fig leaves, they still felt naked. Notice what we find in Genesis chapter 3, and let's read verse 7, and then we'll read verses 8 through 10. And they sewed fig leaves together. Notice, they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And then verse 8 says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said, Where are you? By the way, this is after they cover themselves with the fig leaves. So they're not physically naked. However, notice verse 9. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So even after covering themselves with the fig leaves, they still feel what? Naked because the robe of light no longer covers them. It is the garments made by themselves, their own righteousness. Now the very day that Adam and Eve sinned, they should have suffered ultimate nakedness. Do you know what ultimate nakedness is? Death. You read 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The Apostle Paul speaks of three different states. Being clothed, which is our present existence. Being further clothed, clothed when we receive our immortal body and corruptible body. And in between those times... During death, the Apostle Paul says that we are naked. So in other words, they lost their spiritual robe. Then they lost their physical robe. And ultimately, it would lead to ultimate nakedness, which is what? Which is death. However, God had devised a plan for their nakedness to be covered. There was a heavenly event that took place the very day they sinned. You notice that in Genesis it says, in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. They should have died that day. They should have suffered ultimate nakedness. They should not only have lost their, their spiritual robe, they should not only have lost their literal robe of light, they should have suffered ultimate nakedness, which is death. However, something happened in heaven. And that's why they didn't die that very day. Bible Echo, June 27, 1900. You have all of these quotations in your um, little booklet. Uh, Ellen White wrote, The instant Adam yielded to Satan's temptation and did the very thing which God had said he should not do, Christ, the Son of God, stood between the living and the dead, saying, let the punishment fall on me. I will stand in man's place. 
give him another trial. Transgression placed the whole world under the death sentence. But in heaven there was heard a voice saying, I have found a ransom. Isn't that a beautiful statement? And of course, Ellen White amplifies this in early writing. She says that three times Jesus pleaded with the Father to allow him to come to implement the plan of salvation. And then, of course, later in the Garden of Gethsemane, three times uh, Jesus says to the Father, Father, if it's possible, let me off the hook. <laughs> but your will be done, not mine. By the way, there was also an earthly announcement of the heavenly event. What was the earthly announcement? In Genesis 3, verse 21, we find this very significant verse. And for Adam and his wife, somebody else is doing this for them, the Lord God made tunics of polyester. No. no. <laughs> tunics of skin. And, of course, the personal pronoun is understood, and he clothed them. Three times emphasized. For Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin, and he clothed them. That is the way in which their nakedness was to be covered. Ellen White has this very, very deep uh, quotation in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 68, where she tells us about the earthly announcement of the heavenly event. To Adam, the offering of the first sacrifice was a most painful ceremony. His hand must be raised to take life, which only God could give. It was the first time he had ever witnessed death, and he knew that had he been obedient to God, there would have been no death of man or beast. As he slew the innocent victim, which Jesus had offered himself in heaven as the innocent victim, he trembled at the thought that his sin must shed the blood of the spotless Lamb of God. This scene gave him a deeper and more vivid sense of the greatness of his transgression, which nothing but the death of God's dear Son could expiate. He marveled at the infinite goodness that would give such a ransom to save guilty, the guilty. A star of hope illuminated the dark and terrible future and relieved it of its utter desolation. Now on the cross, Jesus fulfilled the meaning of the first sacrifice. The heavenly event which was announced, which had not taken place yet, and the sacrifice on earth, which was actually a shadow of events to come, was actually enacted on the cross of Calvary, where first of all, Jesus had lived a life of perfect obedience to God's law. He had woven a robe of perfect righteousness by his perfect life. But then something very interesting happened to Jesus. John 19, verses 23 and 24 is very significant. You know, we usually think that when Jesus um, hung on the cross, that his private parts were covered. That's the way that artists usually portray him. But that is not biblical. Jesus hung on the cross stark naked. And there's a reason for that. Notice John 19, 23 and 24. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to each soldier a part. So, these are his inner garments. And also the what? The tunic, that's the outward robe. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from top, the top in one piece. They said therefore among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Why did Jesus hang naked upon the cross? Because he was bearing our sins. And sin causes what? 
causes nakedness. He was bearing our spiritual nakedness. And therefore he hung on the cross physically naked. He was our substitute in other words. Now at the beginning man lost first of all the spiritual robe of righteousness and as a result lost the physical robe of light. But God in redemption basically restores the spiritual robe of righteousness first in this life and then when Jesus comes he will restore the literal robe of light. Let's notice Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. It's at baptism, folks, that we are covered with the robe of Christ's righteousness. At that moment, our life is buried. We resurrect to newness of life in Him. And God looks at Him, not at us. Amen. Notice Galatians 3, 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. By the way, that expression put on is used in the New Testament to speak about putting on clothing. It's the same term that is used in 1 Corinthians 15. This mortal must put on immortality. This corruptible must put on incorruption. So spiritually speaking, we are covered with the spiritual robe of Christ's righteousness at the moment of baptism. And by the way, if I can just digress a little bit here, baptism is more than a mere ceremony. Baptism has profound spiritual significance, which perhaps we have not emphasized as much as we should. Let me just explain what I mean. All of us probably have seen a baptism by immersion. The pastor is standing in the baptistry, raises his hand. He says, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And what is the last thing that the person who is going to be baptized, what is the last thing he or she does before being placed under the water? They stop breathing. They better. What do they do while they're under the water? They don't breathe. What is the first thing they do when they come out of the water? They breathe again. In miniature, they are repeating the experience of Jesus on the cross. Because Jesus breathed his last on the cross. In the tomb, he did not breathe. And when he resurrected, he breathed again. So at baptism, we are incorporated into Christ because in miniature, we have entered into his experience. Are you with me? Amen. So at baptism, God covers us with the spiritual robe of righteousness. When will he cover us with the literal robe of righteousness? Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9. After these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes with palm branches in their hands. Notice, this is the great multitude that stands victorious in heaven and we are told that they are clothed with white robes. So redemption will restore what was lost as a result of sin. Now let's take a look at the root prophecy of how God solves this problem of sin. My favorite verse in the whole Bible, the first major series that we did at Secrets Unsealed was Cracking the Genesis Code, which was 52 one-hour presentations just based on the book of Genesis. And basically it's a development of this one particular verse which encapsulates the entire Bible. In other words, this verse has the whole Bible in seminal form. Now let's read this very, very profound verse. And I want you to notice that there are five elements in this verse. And I will put enmity, first concept, between you, that is the serpent, number two, and the woman, number three. And between your seed, 
that is the serpent's seed, number four, and her seed, number five. He shall bruise your head. By the way, in Hebrew, it is it shall bruise your head because it has to rhyme with seed, which is neuter. But then at the end of the verse, it says, he, which should really be it in Hebrew, shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That is masculine. So the seed is a he. The seed is a person, in other words. Now theologians refer to this as a proto-evangelion, or the first gospel promise. Although God announced this declaration of war and final sentence to the serpent, because God wasn't speaking to Adam and Eve, he was speaking to the serpent, the text clearly indicates that Adam and Eve were present there, hearing God's words. And so this was a promise to them. The imagery, of course, is that of a, a man lifting his foot to crush the head of a serpent. But just before his, his heel crushes the head of the serpent, the serpent bites the man's heel. Ellen White wrote in Signs of the Times, March 26, 1894, these words. Through the very bruising of his heel by Satan. What was the bruising of the heel? Because of what? Affliction, temptation, and sorrow. Christ was gaining the victory in behalf of the human family. He was doing it for us, in other words. As he experienced affliction, temptation, and sorrow. And then we are told, for he triumphed over his enemy in not yielding to his temptation and thus bruised the head of the serpent. So the obedience of Christ in the midst of affliction bruised the head of the serpent. And of course his death on the cross gave the serpent his final death blow. Now you notice that there are five elements in Genesis 3 verse 15. First of all, Enmity. It's what we call the great controversy between good and evil. Secondly, we have a serpent, and the serpent symbolizes whom? Symbolizes Satan. Then we have the woman, and the woman is a symbol of what? A symbol of the church. Then we have the woman's seed, and the woman's seed represents Jesus. And finally, we have the serpent's seed, which represents Satan's human allies. So you'll notice that the enmity runs in three directions. You know, by the way, the illustration in the booklet is, uh, it was cut off. So let me just explain what that chart really says. First of all, there's enmity between the serpent and the woman, right? Right? I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and whom? The woman. So the enmity runs between the serpent and the woman. Then it says, and between your seed, that is the serpent's seed, and the woman's, what? And the woman's seed. But then we are told what the true enmity is. He, that is the woman's seed, will bruise you, the serpent's head, and you will bruise the woman's seeds heal. So it runs serpent woman, serpent seed woman's seed, but the real enmity is serpent versus the woman's seed. Now the question is, who is the serpent's seed? There are several avenues now that we are going to explore to determine who Satan's seed is because Satan works by stealth. Satan is invisible. He works through his seed. Notice 1 John chapter 3 and verse 12. This is referring to Cain killing his brother Abel. And we're told something very interesting about why Cain killed his brother Abel. It says there, not as Cain, who was of whom? Who was of the wicked one? Who is the wicked one? Satan. Satan. 
and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. So whose seed was Cain? Cain was the wicked one's seed. Through whom Satan worked to have Abel killed. Here's another example. Pharaoh. Let's read Exodus chapter 1 verses 15 through 17. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives. Of whom the name of one was Shifra. And the name of the other Pua. And he said. When you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women. And see them on the birth stools. If it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. So was this really Pharaoh's idea? Notice Ezekiel 29 and verse 3. And I'm reading from the King James Version. Ezekiel 29 and verse 3. Notice what Pharaoh is called. Who really wanted the death of Moses? Satan. Why did Satan want the death of Moses? Because he knew all of the prophecies about Moses leading Israel out of Egypt to take them to the promised land from where the Messiah would be born. Satan can read prophecy. He has a very vivid mind. Notice what Pharaoh is called. Speak and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the Pharaoh king of Egypt. The what? The great dragon. Is that the same name that is given to the devil in Revelation 12? Yeah. Absolutely. The great dragon that lieth in the midst of his rivers, which hath said, My river is mine own. I have made it for myself. So in other words, he's claiming creative power. Then we have another example. Who wanted the death of Jesus? You're, you're, all of you are right, by the way. <laughs> Notice Matthew 2, verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. So who wanted the death of, of Jesus according to Matthew 2 verse 16? Herod. But the thing is, when we go to Revelation chapter 12, we find that the dragon stands next to the woman to devour her child as soon as the child is born. So who is Satan's seed to carry out the desired execution of the male son? It is Herod. Ellen White, in Great Controversy, page 38, wrote, The dragon is said to be Satan, for it was he that moved upon Herod to put the Savior to death. So notice, the dragon is said to be Satan in Revelation 12, 9. He, wa he it was that moved upon Herod to put the, the Savior to death. However, the chief agent of Satan in making war upon Christ and his people during the first centuries of the Christian era was what? The Roman Empire, in which paganism was the prevailing religion. Thus, while the dragon primarily represents Satan, it is in a secondary sense a symbol of pagan Rome. So what was the devil's seed in persecuting the Christians in the first centuries? pagan Rome here's another example Revelation 2 verse 10 is referring to the church of Smyrna it is a persecuted church the second church in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 there's a lot of death language connected with the church of Smyrna by the way it's uh, parallel to the red horse the horse of bloodshed in the series on the seals and Revelation 2 verse 10 says something very interesting. Jesus says to the church of Smyrna, the persecuted church by the Roman emperors, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. 
Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. So the devil in person went and arrested them and threw them into prison, right? No. no. Who did the devil use? The Roman emperors. So it says, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And you will have tribulation ten days, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. The Jews in Christ's day were Satan's seed, were the dragon's seed. Notice John 8, 34, where Jesus is speaking. You are of your father the devil. So whose seed were they? They were the devil's seed. Why? Because they wanted to kill Jesus. Did the devil want to kill Jesus? Of course. You are of your father the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. Here's another interesting example. I don't know whether you've caught this before or not, but it's very, very interesting. According to Revelation 12, and verse 12 13 and 14, who was it that persecuted the church during the time, times, and dividing of time. Notice. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman. So who persecuted the woman? The dragon, who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle. Remember the details? That she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So in Revelation chapter 12, the persecutor is the dragon. But in Daniel 7, the persecutor is the little horn. So whose emissary is the little horn? Whose seed is the little horn? The dragon's seed. Are you catching my point? Let's read Daniel chapter 7, 24 and 25. Speaking about the little horn, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, shall intend to change times and law, then the saints shall be given into his hand for the same time period that we read in Revelation 12, for a time and times and what? <coughs> Half a time. So Satan persecuted the saints of God by using the little horn. The little horn was his seed. Because during this period of history, up to the period of the millennium, Satan works by stealth. He works behind the scenes through his earthly emissaries, through his seed. Let's notice one final example. Revelation 16 and verse 13 refers to three powers that will unite to persecute God's people in the end. It says there, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So the three enemies of God's people are the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. But when you get to chapter 19, there's an interesting change. It's speaking there about Jesus coming on a white horse from heaven. The heavenly armies are following him. This is the second coming of Christ. And on earth, there are certain powers that are standing ready to fight against the one who is on the white horse and uh, the armies that come with him. But now notice the change in terminology. No longer is it the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. It says in Revelation 19, verse 19, And I saw the beast, there's one power, and the kings of the earth, there's a second power in their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the, horse, on, the, on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured and with him the what? False prophet. False prophet. Now, what are the three powers in Revelation 19? It is the beast, the kings of the earth, and the false prophet. So what does the dragon represent? The kings of the earth. 
And by the way, Ellen White has a significant statement in Testimonies to Ministers where she says that kings, rulers, and governors are represented by the dragon. Because Satan works through earthly emissaries. Now let me ask you, when is it that the dragon is going to appear in person? <laughs> well, Revelation 20 verse 1 tells us, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So at this point in history, no longer are the kings the dragon, Satan himself is spoken of as a dragon who persecuted God's people. So is it clear who the seed of the serpent is? The seed of the dragon? It represents his emissaries. Whether it be the beast, whether it be the false prophet, whether it be the political rulers of the world who are alienated from God, they are the seed of the serpent. Now the question is, who is the seed of the woman? Well, here we find something very interesting. The Bible refers to the seed, the seed, you notice in capitals, as one. However, the Bible also describes the seed, lowercase, as many. Throughout the course of Old Testament history, this is very important, throughout the course of Old Testament history, the seed, capital letters, would eventually come from a lineage of many preliminary seeds. Are you with me or not? In other words, there would be a series of preliminary seeds all throughout the New Testament that would ultimately bring the seed into the world from their lineage. And here comes another important point. After the seed came, many seeds would then come spiritually from the seed. So there are many seeds before and there are many seeds after, but in the middle you have the seed. Now let's read Genesis 3.15 again. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He, I mention it better, better it according to Hebrew because it has to, has to agree with the neuter noun seed. The seed is not masculine or feminine. It is an it. And so the correct translation is, it shall bruise your head and you shall bruise, and now it is the masculine, his heel. So we know the seed is a he. Now, the Roman Catholic Douay Rhymes version is the only Bible version that erroneously claims that the woman would crush the head of the serpent. Referring, of course, in their minds to Mary. Mary would crush the head of the serpent. This is how it reads in the Douay Rhymes version. I will put enmities between thee and the woman, and thy seed and her seed. She shall crush thy head, and thou shalt lie in wait for her heel. Interesting how they shift the prophecy from Jesus to Mary. Now the first example of preliminary seeds we find in the case of Abel and Seth. We're told in Genesis 4 verse 25, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. And then she explains why she called his name Seth. For God, said she, has appointed me another seed so who was first the seed? It must have been Abel. Another seed instead of Abel whom Cain slew. Everyone in the Old Testament holy line of the Messiah was a preliminary seed from whom the seed would eventually come. And this is a significant point. The Bible almost exclusively attributes seed to males. But Genesis 3.15 
and Matthew 1 verse 16 attribute the seed to females, Eve and Mary. Now, in the Old Testament, seed is one and also many. Let's notice this. Genesis 12 verse 3. God says to Abraham, I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, if you read only that verse, you're not sure, uh, you know, whether the seed that is promised is one or is many, although it says, in thee all the families of the earth shall be blessed. You get the impression that this is talking about many seeds. But now notice Genesis 22, 17 and 18. Genesis 22, 17 and 18. Who is it that brings the blessing that God promised to give through Abraham? Is it many or is it one? It says there that in blessing, this is a repetition of the promise God made to Abraham, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed, what? As the stars of heaven. So these are many seeds, right? As the stars of heaven. And as the sand which is upon the seashore. That's many. And then the last half of the verse is very interesting. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his, of his enemies. And in thy seed, now the seed becomes one. In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Obviously, it's not all the preliminary seeds that are going to be, bring the blessing. It is actually the seed, Jesus Christ. You say, how do we know that? Because the New Testament refers to these verses that we just read from Genesis 22. Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Listen carefully. Christ has redeemed us, from the curse of the law. Having become a curse for us. For it is written. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham. Might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. That we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith. Let me ask you. Who is it that brings the blessing? Is it all, is it all the families of the earth that bring the blessing? All of the preliminary seeds that bring the blessing? No. We're clearly told. As the Apostle Paul is referring to Genesis 22 that Christ has redeemed us and as a result the blessing of Abraham can come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. In fact, for the Apostle Paul, the seed is one. Notice Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16. This is so clear that no one need misunderstand. Now to Abraham... And his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So do you notice that in the Old Testament we have, God says to Abraham, you know, there's going to be many seeds for you, like the stars of heaven, like the sand of the sea, but then he says the blessing will come through the seed. So you have the preliminary seeds that eventually lead to the seed. By the way, the Bible also tells us that God promised the seed through David. Notice 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. By the way, we'll come back to Galatians 3, 26 through 29, a little bit later on. Uh, it's, it's in your uh, booklet, but we'll come back to those verses a little bit later on. Notice 1 Samuel 7, verse 12. And when thy days be fulfilled, God is saying this to David, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up what? Thy seed after thee, which shall proceed of the, thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. How many seeds? One, his kingdom. Notice Psalm 89, verse 29. Once again, God promised a singular seed from the lineage of David. It says there in Psalm 89 and verse 29, His seed 
also I will make to endure forever. And now notice, it's one person. And his throne as the days of heaven. Who is this fulfilled in? Acts 13, 22 and 23 tells us who fulfills this prophecy about the seed of David establishing the eternal kingdom. It says, And when he had removed him, that is King Saul, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, who? Jesus. So I understand that in the Old Testament you have seeds, preliminary seeds. David is one of them. Abraham's one of them. Abel is one of them. Seth is one of them. All of the holy line. But they all point, these preliminary seeds only exist to bring into the world the seed. But then after the seed comes into the world, then he brings forth seeds. Notice Galatians 3, 26 to 29. Here you have what takes place after the seed brings the blessing of Abraham. It says in Galatians 3, verse 26, For ye are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ. And now notice, if you be Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Are you, are you following this? So, are we Abraham's seed? Now, wait a minute. I thought Abraham's seed was the seed. I thought all of these preliminary seeds were seeds. Yes, the preliminary seeds were a holy line that he bring, eventually bring the seed, and whoever links up with the seed becomes the seed's seed. Notice Romans 4 and verse 16. This is very important for what we're going to discuss in our next study together tomorrow. Notice Romans 4 verse 16. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. That is salvation. To the end, the promise might be sure to all what? To all the seed. Not to that only which is of the law. In other words, not only to the seed which is of the Jews, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Many seeds who have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. Spiritual seeds of Christ. Notice Romans chapter 9 and verses 6 through 8. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. For they are not all Israel which are of Israel. You tell an Israelite, you're not an, that hasn't accepted Christ, you're not an Israelite. <laughs> They'll say, you're crazy. I was born in Jerusalem. I have Jew Jewish blood in my veins. But you see what defines who is a Jew or not, who is an Israelite or not, is not your ethnic group it's not the blood that flows in your veins. It's not genetics. It is your relationship to Jesus. So it says there, not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is because I, from Isaac the Messiah comes. That is... They which are the children of the flesh, that is literal Israelites, are not the children of God, but the children of the promised are counted for the seed. Now, the best illustration that I can find of this is found in agriculture. When a farmer plants a single tomato seed in the earth, By the way, I have tomato plants in my backyard. So this is not theory. This is practice. We still have, you know, 
It's amazing. Bell peppers this time of year grow phenomenally. We have lots of good red bell peppers, yellow bell peppers, green bell peppers. Not like Dr. Teske's, mind you, because he has a regular big garden with all kinds of things. But when a farmer plants a single tomato seed in the earth, it dies, doesn't it? And then resurrects, we call it germinates, grows, and finally produces what? Many seeds. Many seeds. In a similar manner, Jesus is the singular seed who died, resurrected, and as a result produces the seeds, many seeds. Notice John 12, 24. This is not my illustration. This is an illustration that Jesus gave. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. So if Jesus had not been placed in the grave, if he hadn't died and been placed in the grave, he would have remained alone. But if it dies, it produces what? Much seed. Where does the much seed come from? From the seed. Are you following me? Yes. Notice this remarkable statement from Desire of Ages where this is more fully explained. The grain of wheat that preserves its own life can produce no fruit. It abides alone. That is a singular seed. Christ could, if he chose, save himself from death. However, should he do this, he must abide, abide alone. That is, he would be a singular seed. He could bring no sons and daughters to God. That is, the seed's seed, if you please. Only by yielding up his life could he impart life to humanity. Only by falling into the ground to die could he become the seed of that vast harvest. The great multitude that out of many seeds I've added in the brackets because it's understood. That great multitude that out of many seeds of every nation and kindred and tongue and people are redeemed to God. So because the seed died, resurrected, there will be many seeds. Jesus said, because I live, you will live also. Now we have a couple of minutes left. So let's just go to the next section, the tri-directional enmity in Genesis 3.15 and Revelation 12. Tomorrow in our first study together, uh, during the worship service, we are going to take a look at Revelation 12. Because there, amplified in minute detail, is the message of Revelation chapter 3. I mean Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. So let's go here to the section that says, the tri-directional enmity in Genesis 3.15 and Revelation 12. In Genesis 3.15, the enmity runs in three directions. Serpent versus woman, woman's seed versus serpent's seed, the serpent versus the woman's seed. Is that clear? The real enmity is between what? The serpent and the woman's seed, the seed. But there's also enmity between the serpent and the woman, and between the serpent's seed and the woman's seed, which we've already identified. Revelation 12 also has three dimensions of the enmity. First of all, we're going to notice that it is the serpent versus the woman's seed. That's how the chapter begins. The serpent versus the woman's seed. Then, the serpent versus the woman. And finally, the serpent versus the seed of the woman's seed. You know, usually we... Uh, you know, I think that perhaps we don't interpret correctly Revelation 12, 17, where it says that he shall make war against the remnant of her seed. You know, we, we think that the remnant of her seed uh, is some last group 
that's going to be in this world. And I believe that it's what a, a last group that is going to be in this world. But let me explain how I understand this verse. It says that the dragon is going to make war against the remnant of her seed. And some people say, well, that's the remnant of the woman's seed. No. It's the remnant of the woman's seed. I don't know if you're following what I'm saying. In other words, he will make war against the remnant of her seed. Let me ask you, has the woman's seed been identified in the chapter? Who is the woman's seed? Jesus. So who is the remnant of her seed? It is the remnant of Jesus. Are you with me or not? So in other words, it's not the final remnant of the woman's seed. It is the final remnant of Jesus. Because Jesus has been identified in the chapter as the seed of the woman at the very beginning of the chapter. So, in our study tomorrow, Lord willing, we will further develop this theme of Genesis 3.15 as it appears in Revelation chapter 12. Now let me ask you, did you understand what we studied this evening? Was it clear? Raise your hand if it was clear. Oh, it's been such a long day, some of you don't raise your hand. You know, um, I hope that it's just um, uh, the fact that you're tired. It's difficult to raise your arm because it's very important that we understand what we have studied so far because tomorrow we're going to really, really study some exciting things about the fulfillment in Revelation chapter 12. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before your awesome throne in the powerful name of Jesus. We thank you for your word. What a terrible thing it would be to live in this world without any guidance in your word. We wouldn't have any idea what's happening. We wouldn't know what's going to take place. We would have no hope. But thank you because you have given us in your word a clear delineation of everything that would happen from the Garden of Eden all the way till after the millennium and the creation of new heavens and new earth. Thank you for giving this, us this wonderful worldview that gives us comfort, gives us hope that this world is not the end, that this world is not our home. We thank you for having been with us in our study. We ask that you will continue to be with us in the last three segments of this particular study that we're doing. And we ask it in the precious and most holy name of Jesus. Amen.